Chapter 3 Consumer Behavior Consumer behavior is the basis of all the demand in the marketplace. So in the last few chapters, we looked at three big entities, the consumers from which demand generates, the producers which produce goods and service in the marketplace. So now we're gonna go deep into consumer behavior. How is consumer behavior shaped and what is the basis of demand? So let's look at this consumer. A consumer has a set of choices the choices are governed by the budget. How much money can they allocate towards fulfilling the choices that they have for the preferences of goods and services? So everyone wants certain goods and services to be bought from the marketplace. And they have to make a hard choice, a trade-off, every single time. The trade-off is between, hey, I, I prefer to buy this watch or I prefer to buy this phone, but this cost this much money versus this cost a little bit less. So the budget comes into play. Preferences and budgets, these are the two competing forces and the choice is something that the consumer ends up making for balancing the choice and preferences and maximizing the well-being or the maximizing the utility for the money that is spent. And when those choices are made, that is the basis of demand. So understanding the budget, understanding choices, understanding preferences, this is this is the basis of demand. Are all choices rational? That's a very deep topic. The topic uh, is behavioral economics, which is a separate topic altogether. But not all choices are rational, but let us assume that these are rational choices. A lot of times people make choices based on uh, where they live, their neighbors, their friends, and you know the culture in which they live. And so that's a lot of, lot of complexity around it. But let's assume that choices are rational, meaning uh, the consumer will maximize for their happiness, well-being, independent of like irrational choices. They'll make rational decisions. So now we've broken down demand into three big areas, choices, budgets, preferences, right? And so what are the characteristics of a choice? A choice is, let us assume that it is rational. That is number one. And a choice is between various preferences rankable. Meaning you can say choice A is better than choice B, and you can also say choice B is greater than choice C. So you can have a canonical rank. There is no like a choice A and B is the same. Let's assume that. And then the third is that those choices are transferable and they are transitive. Meaning if A is greater than B in the preference and B is greater than C, then A is assumed to be greater than C, right? So the last bit is that the choice uh, is such that you get more of it, it's always better. So more of certain things is better. So these three assumptions are the assumptions of choice. Now let's understand the preferences. To understand preferences, there is this curve called indifference curve. So basically if, the, if a consumer is trying to uh, choose between number of units of clothing versus the number of units of food, there will be this curve that you can plot. At this point, you can see that, hey, two units of clothes and, and five units of food is good enough. So you can say the choice of this market basket is two and five. But at the same time, the, the consumer might be okay giving up one unit of cloth for additional five units of food. So they might say, hey, even if you give me one unit of uh, cloth and then 10 unit of food, then these are equitable. And similarly, giving up two units of food is okay if you get two more units of clothes. So you could say four and three is equal. So if you see, you can plot out a curve that says all of these choices are equal for the consumer. These choices or these preferences of a combination is, is basically a set of preferences. It, this is the indifference curve. Basically, all points on this curve give the same level of satisfaction, independent, depending on the quantity. So four units of cloth and three units of food um, is this in one market basket and is equal to two units of cloth and five units of food and is equal to the third basket, which is one unit of cloth and 10 units of food. So when you can plot this, you can easily say, hey, uh, how are the choices uh, varying? You can, you can equate these three preferences. But as you can see, the marginal value is going down, meaning first they were okay giving up two units of cloth 
for two units of food. But then you see they're only willing to give up one unit of cloth for five more units of food. So as you can see, the, the, there's diminishing substitution. So that is called the marginal rate of substitution. Basically, the rate of substitution diminishes over time because consumers like market baskets that are um, that have each units of goods that they want, right? You, you cannot just live without food and you can say all I will buy is clothing, right? So there's bare minimum certain requirements of certain food items. Like we drew these two variables, you can now start drawing various other preferences. And once you draw that, you can get a very clear idea of what are the preferences that my consumer has. And these preferences change based on the budget, which is the second part. So we understood the choices, we understood the preferences. Now let's look at the third part, which is the budget. A consumer co goes to the market typically with a budget in mind. They have an upper bound of how much money that they're, they're willing to spend. And that line can be drawn with a budget line. So if for a given cloth uh, number of units and food, let's say they are, they are willing to spend uh, $80. Let's say the budget is $80. So if they buy 40 units of cloth, assuming one unit of cloth is $2 and one unit of food is $1, then they can buy 40 units of cloth and zero food or 80 units of food and zero cloth, or they can buy something in between or anything here in the budget line. So the budget line represents the upper bound of them spending everything that they had thought of for that budget, for that expenditure. So, so if we combine now the budget line with the indifference curve or the curve of preferences, then you can see that certain times the consumer will buy this, certain times they may buy here, and certain times they may buy here, right? So these curves can be overlaid based on the consumer types. Once you can overlay both the budget and the preferences, you can very quickly get to what is, what is it that the consumer really wants? You know, you can do this, which is that you can change the price. Let's say now you change this to be the budget line. And if given this option, if the consumer still buys this point, then you know that their real preference is this and not this. This was point A, which is what they bought. And then if the price of, uh, let's say, food went down and then they bought more of food, then you can say that even if they were given choice A, which was their previous choice, and now with choice B, they bought B number of units, more units of food, that means they really wanted to buy more food. But for various constraints of budget, they balanced it that way. And similarly, if you change your price of your goods, multiple different variations, you can quickly find out what is it that this consumer or this set of consumers are willing to pay? And this can be used to really understand the revealed preferences of your consumers. So basically you change around the budget line uh, for the consumer, for the prices that you control, and then you can quickly find out how much people are paying. So this is quite interesting. If, you, if, if we now have a detailed understanding of what their preferences are, and we know what their budget is for the typical spend, you can now start to forecast demand, right? So we, we understood choices, budget preferences, budget is to the budget line, reveal preferences, and then there's this curve that tells you the indifference or the utility of a given set of items, right? Now, the, the thing to remember is this MRS, marginal rate of substitution. We saw that there's a diminishing substitution rate, meaning it goes down. Similarly, uh, there was various studies done which shows this y-axis is satisfaction with life and then x-axis is, let's say, money made. And so if you see this curve, it flattens out, almost flattens out, it keeps going up, but there's diminishing marginal uh, rate of substitution. More money, eventually, at certain point, you know, if you have to give much, much, much more money to get just a little bit more satisfaction. So this is interesting to note that there's marginal rate of substitution for money made after certain periods of uh, per capita income or certain income made. So with this, the, we, we covered this in the last, but there are perfect substitutes and perfect complements in terms of goods. Uh, perfect substitutes are when butter and margarine, right? like the quantity, uh, the demand goes up together, the price goes up together. 
complements are like automobile and gasoline price. Uh, for gasoline price, if it goes up, the automobile sales typically goes down. So they are complements. Uh, so substitute and complements are important to remember when we draw the preferences, budget, and demand uh, forecasting. So now, based on this, there are there are three indexes that we will go into to understand like how is let's say social security uh, coming up with uh, the checks that are being paid out. How do they know this is good enough money to be to be uh, given to the retired person? They use this thing called uh, CPI and PPI, the Consumer Price Index and the Producer Price Index that we saw in the previous videos. But basically, these are ways of uh, finding out what are the rates of inflation impact uh, the cost of goods, the cost of market uh, market baskets, right? In this case, the market basket had clothing and food, but what 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 was the purchasing power? 10 years back, 20 years back, or whatever that base rate is, and what is it now? And then they try to use that to increase the pay given out. So there are three ways. Now let's look at how you could calculate uh, the purchasing power or the how much more money you should give so that the, the person who's retired can actually buy the same level of goods and services. So now let's take an example of 2010 and 2020. 2010 is the base year and 2020 is the current year, right? So now let's look at the same two examples, food and clothing. Let's say in the base year, quantity and price, 20 units of food were bought at $15 per unit, and 10 units of clothing was bought at $20 per unit, and then the total budget spent was $500 in, let's say, 2010. But then let's say the prices went up in 2020. Food for the same unit now cost $25, and clothing now cost 30 And we saw clearly that the quantity also shifts. Certain quantities goes up and down based on we saw the demand curve, remember, from last few videos. The demand goes up as the price goes down. Demand goes down as the price goes up. But, similar, but certain demands are not elastic, which we saw as well in the last few videos, what is elastic versus inelastic. And so in this case, uh, food quantity is inelastic. It, it stays the same even though the price almost uh, went up two times. But the clothing, 50% uh, increase in the price, the clothing demand went down. But even in the aggregate, we still, uh, we see $650 spent in 2020 uh, for this market basket of food and clothing. So now if you want to find out like how much you should pay someone in 2020 when they start, when they're retired in 2010, let's say you were giving them $500. Should you continue to give them $500? The answer is no, because it's inflation. Inflation as measured by CPI and PPI uh, but is that the right proxy? So there are various indexes uh, used. Last buyer's index, cost of living index, and cost chain index. Last buyer's index basically compares um, the base year's quantity, the base year's quantity versus the uh, current year. So if you see 20 times 25, so if I were to buy the base year quantities today, right? How much would it be compared to what it was in the base year's prices? So 20 times 25, 10 times 30, divided by 20 times 15, 10 times 20. So it's comparing, if I were to buy the same quantity of food and clothing that I used to buy in 2010 today, versus what it was in 2010 prices, that is last buyer's index. It's basically saying, I'm gonna, I'm gonna look at quantities of the base year and compare it to the price for this year, price of uh, the base year. And that comes out to be 1.6. Basically saying it has gone up by 60%, 1.6 times, right? Uh, cost of living index on the other hand is saying, what does it cost to buy for the quantity of goods this year, so 20 and five for the price this year versus quantity and goods of base year. So it's comparing current year's quantity with base year's quantity. So current year's quantity times current year's price, 20 times 25, 5 times 30, divided by 20 times 15, 10 times 20. 
So that comes out to be 1.3. It says 30% increase you should give in 20, 2020. Past year index is, 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 is the very opposite. It says, hey, what is my current year's quantity? And I'm going to compare that to base year's uh, uh, current year's quantity. I'm going to compare that for current year's price versus base year's price. So it says 20 times 25, 5 times 30, divide by 20 times 15, 5 times 20. So it's basically saying, I'm going to just compare what, what, I'm, what my consumers are buying today to today's price to what my consumers are buying today to 2010's price. So that comes out to be 1.8. So clearly, these are the spectrums, right? Last pairs index greatly exaggerates how much how much money uh, it, the users are gonna be spending today because it's just gonna say that, hey, Bayesian's prices, Bayesian's quantity is what it's gonna take. But preferences change, we saw in the demand curve, right? Preferences change based on price. So this is too aggressive, this is too conservative. It's basically saying, I'm just gonna make whatever my goods and services today are being bought for the base year's price. Cost of living is, is a middle ground, and cost of living is what is used uh, in a weighted average way to calculate CPI and PPI today. Weighted average is basically saying, I'm gonna update my quantity every few years or so, instead of like this 10 years, 20 years, right? So even then, you could say CPI is an exaggerated version of cost of living index. It's somewhere between Las Paris index and cost of living indexes where the CPI and PPI are. But this is very important because if we can predict how much to give to social security, how much inflation there really is, then a lot of money can be can be given to the right people. Otherwise, they'll not be able to afford the same services. At the same time, if you're paying them too much, then that's also not good. So with this, we know so much more about demand. Demand has three basic things choices that the consumers make to buy certain things based on budget and preferences. Preferences are the indifference curve, the utility function. They're willing to buy a set of goods and services in a combination as long as it maximizes their happiness or utility. And then there's budget, which is a very, very important aspect of any decision making. And then there is the big, big learning was the satisfaction of life with marginal rate of substitution, MRS, as to how the utility goes down drastically uh, after a certain point, and people really like uh, a balanced set of goods and services, and not extreme. And when they when they go for extreme, it's 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 typically not consuming any of the other, but that doesn't sustain for the long run. And we talked about various types of indexes, how social security is calculated. That was a real real life example. So now we understood consumer demand in much more detail. Thanks. Hope you enjoyed this. Uh, we will see you in the next chapter. Thanks.